Welcome to the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast. Today we're talking about promissory estoppel as part of our Listen and Learn series. Your Bar Exam Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess, that's me. We're here to demystify the Bar Exam experience so you can study effectively, stay sane, and hopefully pass and move on with your life. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website Career Dicta. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on your favorite listening app and check out our sister podcast, the Law School Toolbox Podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on barexamtoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Listen and Learn series on the Bar Exam Toolbox Podcast. Today we are talking about promissory estoppel, or what some might call the double stamp it's no erases of contract law. In other words, you can't take it back now, you promised. We've all heard it before, in the grocery store, on the sidewalk, during a meal at a restaurant, a child insisting to an exasperated parent, but you said I could. You promised if I finished my dinner, we could get ice cream. You promised we could go to the movies once I did all my homework. You promised if I didn't hit my brother for a full week, you would buy me that toy. It's the job of contract law to determine which one of these promises and all of the other promises we seem to make and break regularly are actually enforceable. So when is a promise breakable and when is it a contract? Remembering back to contracts law in law school, you may already know the answer. A promise is enforceable when it is made as part of a bargain for exchange of legal detriment, which has been accompanied by an offer and acceptance. Today, we'll be unpacking that legal language and focusing on that bargain for exchange part, also known as consideration. Specifically, we'll explore what a person can do when there was a promise for a promise, but it wasn't enough to count as full consideration. What if someone acts in reliance on that promise, only to find at the end of the performance that they didn't have a contract to begin with? Say, for example, you've got a really savvy kid who is looking to sue her parents for one of these promises we mentioned. Put aside the ability of children to sue. That's another topic we can skip for now. For the purpose of this example, according to the promisee, her parents promised her that if she completed her math homework, they would all go out to the movies. Go back and review an adequate consideration. You'll find things like moral consideration, past consideration, illusory promise, and other scenarios you should get familiar with. Under consideration rules, a pre-existing duty is not consideration, meaning that if you are being promised something in exchange for something you were already obligated to do anyway, then there's no consideration. A kid is obligated to do her homework, and this kid would be obligated to do her math homework whether or not there was a movie on the other side of that homework. Would she have skipped out on doing her homework entirely if her parents hadn't promised her a movie? Well, maybe she would have. Maybe she completed her homework despite the fact that she would rather do literally anything else exclusively in reliance on the promise that her family would go to the movies after, regardless of the fact that she would have been obligated to do her homework without that promise. Could she claim promissory estoppel? Well, because promissory estoppel stretches the bounds of contract law, The stakes typically have to be a bit higher for the court to apply it. But we're starting to paint a picture of when a person would claim promissory estoppel. When a promisor made a promise that induced the promisee to act in reasonable and detrimental reliance on that promise. In other words, I would never have made my move unless what you said was true. Or in our scenario, the whole reason I did the homework was because of the movie. The clues you're looking for, which are the hallmarks of promissory estoppel, are a promise plus detrimental reliance. So let's break that out into elements. First, we have a promise. This promise has to be made in exchange for something that is not enforceable as consideration. You know how a promise for a promise can count as goods consideration? Well, that's not what we're looking for here. Otherwise, it would itself be adequate consideration. And then you have a regular contract. Remember, what we need is a situation where the consideration fails, situations that fall short of a normal enforceable contract. Second, we have an inducement of an act or forbearance to act. This promise will call upon the promisee to behave in a particular way, 
or the promisee will take it upon themselves to act in a certain way in response to the promise. Third, we have the most important and testable element, reliance on the promise. And this reliance has to be both reasonable and detrimental. The promisee must have actually relied on this promise when they took action. And this part is important. That reliance has to be reasonable based on the promisor's representations, meaning that a reasonable person in the same situation would also rely. Additionally, that reliance must have cost them in some way, whether financially, emotionally, or some other way that indicates detriment that needs to be compensated. So let's move out of the realm of math homework and raise the stakes a bit to see how this would play out in an exam setting. So let's start with a hypo. This is loosely based on the examples and explanations book for Contracts 7th edition, chapter 8. Wealthy Uncle Rich told his niece Penny that he thought it was important she get a college education and he wanted to help her do that. He said that if she enrolled in college, he would give her $40,000 a year to put towards tuition. On the strength of that promise, Penny enrolled herself and committed to a tuition payment of $40,000 for her first year. Uncle Rich did not give her any money. Can Penny recover? The first step on an exam, after looking at applicable law and formation steps one and two, offer and acceptance, is to see whether there is consideration. Remember, it's only when consideration arguably fails that you want to consider promissory estoppel as a backup measure. So what about this hypo? Let's skip those preliminary steps and look at consideration. Maybe Uncle Rich was just promising an unconditional gift. In that case, there was no bargain for exchange. What you would want to do is argue about whether consideration is met first. Then, if there is an argument that it is not, you would move to promissory estoppel. So let's go through our steps. First, is there a promise? We have a pretty clear promise, right? Uncle Rich said he would give Penny money. This is backed up by the fact that he said college is important and he wanted to help her. This element is easy to check off. Step two, was there inducement? Well, the fact stated that on the strength of that promise of the money, Penny enrolled in school. It definitely sounds like she was induced to go to school because of the promise of the money. In other words, she probably wouldn't have done that if the promise had not been in place. Step three, what about reliance? We need to decide whether Penny changed her position in some way because of the promise. It could be either an act or a decision not to act. Here, Penny enrolled in school and signed up for a $40,000 tuition bill. That's an affirmative act, and it's something she was not legally obligated to do. It was a move she made because she thought that she had a safety net of her uncle's promise. That's a good way to think of this. If the promisee is a tightrope walker and they need to move forward or move back, they are doing so because they're counting on the safety net of the promise to catch them. If so, the reliance element is met. Don't forget this move needs to be both reasonable and detrimental as well. So we need to see if a reasonable person would have done the same thing Penny did. Uncle Rich is wealthy and said he thought college was important. So he seems like a person who would actually follow through with his promise to help pay tuition. Relying on him was probably reasonable. The detriment to Penny is also clear because she incurred a bill, and unless the uncle pays, she will be out $40,000. Thus, reliance is definitely met as well. So this was a pretty easy example. So let's move into something a tiny bit more complicated, something like what you might see on the real bar exam. This question is from the July 2002 California Bar Exam. We've edited the call of the question slightly just to narrow the scope to promissory estoppel. Travelco ran a promotional advertisement, which included a contest promising to fly the contest winner to Scotland for a one-week vacation. Travelco's advertisement stated, The winner's name will be picked at random from the phone book for this trip to golfer's heaven. If you're in the book, you will be eligible for this dream vacation. After reading Travelco's advertisement, Polly had the telephone company change her unlisted phone number to a listed one just in time for it to appear in the telephone book that Travelco used to select the winner. Luckily for Polly, her name was picked and Travelco notified her. That night, Polly celebrated her good fortune by buying and drinking an expensive bottle of champagne. The next day, Polly bought new luggage and costly new golfing clothes for the trip. When her boss refused to give her a week's unpaid leave so she could take the trip, she quit 
thinking that she could look for a new job when she returned from Scotland. After it was too late for Polly to retract her job resignation, Travel Co. advised her that it was no longer financially able to award the free trip that it had promised. Polly sues for breach of contract and seeks to recover damages for the following. 1. The cost of listing her telephone number. 2. The champagne. 3. The luggage and clothing. And 4. The loss of her job. Let's see what poor Polly's options are in terms of recovering damages for these losses by going back to our steps. First, was there a promise that would be unenforceable as a contract? Because this podcast episode is about promissory estoppel, we will quickly conclude that the answer is yes. And the problem with forming a contract here is defective consideration, right? What's the problem with the consideration here? The facts say that Travel Co. ran an ad promising to fly a contest winner to Scotland and that the contest winner would be picked at random from the telephone book. The issue is that Travel Co. is not asking for anything in return. In other words, there is no bargain for exchange of legal detriment. That is what is called a gratuitous promise, which is not consideration. Polly will, of course, argue that she wasn't in the phone book in the first place, so she had to pay to her detriment in order to have her number listed in order to be eligible to win the contest. But Travel Co. didn't say, hey, Polly, list your number in exchange for being a contest winner. It didn't even offer the trip in exchange for newly bought listings. Polly opted into the contest by listing her number in response to what was just a promise to send someone on a trip if they were in the phone book and happened to be picked. So we don't have consideration, but we do have a promise to send Polly to Scotland for a trip to Golfer's Heaven on Travel Coast Dime because she was the lucky winner. So the first element gets checked off. Second, did the promise induce action? While we know that Travel Co. didn't explicitly ask Polly to do anything, it is safe to assume that a person would take some action in preparation for an international trip. So the actions Polly took were listing her phone number, drinking excessive celebratory champagne, buying luggage and golf clothes, and quitting her job. So the second element is met. So this brings us to our third element, which is Polly's reasonable and detrimental reliance. Were the actions Polly took reasonable in light of the promise? So let's move through them one by one. And as a tip on the bar exam, where you see someone in the fact pattern doing several different things, consider analyzing each one separately, especially when the call of the question lays them out one by one. So here we've got Polly listing the phone number, the champagne, buying golf clothes, and quitting her job. First, she paid to have her phone number listed in the phone book. This sort of action isn't one that Polly could expect compensation for because Travel Co. didn't make any guarantees that if Polly listed her number, she would win. The winner's name was randomly selected from the phone book. So at the time Polly put herself in the running, she didn't have any reason to expect that she would get anything in return or get paid back for the cost of listing her number. The fact that she won was pure luck. So Polly would not be entitled to damages for the listing because she could not reasonably rely on getting anything in return. A reasonable person would not think they would get paid back for this. So then Polly does win, and she buys an expensive bottle of champagne. It's probable that Polly wouldn't have bought this champagne if she hadn't just won a free trip to Scotland. And indeed, the purchase was specifically intended to celebrate this win once Travel Co. notified her that she was the winner. On the other hand, you could argue that while Polly is exercising her free will to celebrate as she pleases, that choice shouldn't be Travel Co.'s responsibility. There was nothing in Travel Co.'s representation that she won the trip that specifically was intended to induce her to go sipping on some Dom Perignon in reliance on a promise. Reasonable minds can differ about whether Polly could recover for the reliance on Travel Co.'s promise to send her to Scotland when she bought the bottle of champagne. The important thing is to argue it a couple of different ways. Now, one key word here is expensive. Would a reasonable person who just won a nice vacation go celebrate with champagne? Maybe. And that seems just fine. Would a reasonable person who is about to quit their job celebrate with an expensive champagne? Maybe not. And there's a hole in the facts. Just how expensive? Was the champagne half of Polly's paycheck? If so, that's probably not something a reasonable person would buy, especially if they were about to quit their job. Point these things out in your arguments. And remember, every fact in the fact pattern is carefully chosen. Always use these clues to form your argument. 
So did Polly reasonably rely on Travel Co.'s promise when she bought the luggage and costly golfing clothes? Again, bar takers could land in different places here. It's probably reasonable that if Polly didn't have sufficient luggage to begin with, she would have to buy some in order to go on the trip. I think a court could feel comfortable finding that she bought the luggage in reliance on Travel Co.'s representation that she would soon be headed to Scotland. Additionally, she was going on a golfing trip, so it would make sense for her to buy appropriate clothes, though court could take issue with the amount she decided to spend and perhaps settle on a reasonable amount that doesn't fully match the costliness of what she had purchased. Sort of like the champagne idea. Just how expensive were the clothes? Well, we don't know, but the facts say costly, so argue about what that might mean. But yes, the clothes and the luggage are fairly appropriate purchases Polly made in anticipation of a golfing trip to Scotland, and it was reasonable for her to rely on Travel Co.'s representation that the trip was happening when she bought these items. But then there is quitting her job. Really, Polly, for a one-week vacation, don't be distracted by the fact that this is one of the most detrimental actions Polly took. It is also quite possibly the least reasonable. And remember, the actions taken in reliance need to be both reasonable and detrimental. Winning a free trip does not always necessitate blowing up your life. And here, Polly made a long-term choice in exchange for a short-term opportunity. The fact that Polly's boss sounded pretty crappy does not mean that Travel Co. will be held responsible for inducing Polly's choice to resign. You could definitely argue this was not a reasonable action for her to take. So, would you come out the same way? Can you make an argument for the reasonableness of any of these that we didn't make? We welcome you to come to your own conclusions and let us know what you think. Remember, being successful on the bar exam is less about what you conclude and more about reasoning steps you take to get to the conclusion and how you explain them to the grader. And with that, we're out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Bar Exam Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to reach out to myself and Allison at lee at barexamtoolbox.com or allison at barexamtoolbox.com or you can always visit our website contact form at barexamtoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Mm -hmm.